a kid, mm -hmm. how many times did you subscribe and unsubscribe to Columbia House? Oh, I have no freaking idea. It was probably that many times, but I loved everything about Columbia House because I wasn't paying the bill. Now, see, I had my first <laughs> job when I was like 12 years old uh, um, um, delivering papers, right? Uh -huh. And so, and then I started cutting grass. So I was always, I, there's no way that I could have ordered from Columbia House. You know my mom. Yeah. There is no way I could have had anything mail order shipped to the house and then had a bill. I'm like, oh yeah, mom, you just have to pay that bill now. That that was not a thing. I think I joined maybe before I turned 16 once uh -huh. and then never paid that bill. And then after I turned 16 and I was working and I started getting into radio, you know I started radio when I was 16 yeah. years old, uh, that I, I probably started expanding the collection then, yeah. I, I think I probably started when I was like, my gosh, I don't know, probably maybe 12 or 13 Right, was probably the first. I don't know. That's kind of what I remember. I don't remember that far back very well. <laughs> but I think probably when I started, I got a, my first job at 15. Right. And then so probably by the time I was 16 or so, I had to pay for my own, you know, Columbia house. And that's probably about the time. I don't know. Maybe by the time I was I know I was done with it by the time I was 21. Well, I know that for sure. Think about this, okay? This podcast, our playlist, we put this out on Spotify, yes. right? Okay. Before Spotify downloads, and it still happens. I mean, Apple Music is still there to download, but yeah. that's, you know, yeah, not yeah, a lot yeah. of people are doing that necessarily now. More streaming is happening. But before any of that, we were all buying physical products. We were buying records, cassettes, mm -hmm. and CDs. And a lot of us grew our collection through Columbia House. Oh, of course. But what you have to think about when it comes to the mail magazine based advertising in the late 90s, uh -huh. AOL, they dominated over everyone. A close second, though, would be BMG and Columbia House. And there's a reason for that. We're going to get into that. How many magazines would you see that two page spread? Oh, my gosh. That would have it looked like a little jukebox, had the titles there and it would maybe be a penny. Maybe it was a dollar you order. And or then there you get like the bonus or like 101 like choices to choose from or something sure. like that. And was right. it buy buy 11 and get the 12th one for I'm sorry. No, no, no. Buy one for a penny and get what? Like. 11 or 12 free? It, it changed. You know, they, sometimes they would do that. Sometimes it would be 10. It would be different offers at different times. Columbia House and BMG also helped some records become hits. Really? Hootie and the Blowfish, their uh, their album, Cracked Rear View, yes. sold 3 million copies just through those services. Oh, wow. So you think about the mid-90s. It was thanks to those services that Hootie and the Blowfish became a household name. Mm -hmm. But where it all really started was back in the early 50s. When Columbia Records, a division of Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS. Okay. Columbia Records oh, wanted people secret. to switch away from 45s to 33s, long playing records. Mm -hmm. And in order to get them into their house, well, why don't we do a loss leader where we sell one to you and you get five or six more So they free. were doing that with vinyl before they ever did it with like. Oh, absolutely. Oh, see, now I didn't know that. Yeah. And like, the thing I is. Only re I'm sorry. I only remember. Was it like the tapes and CDs? No, no, no. This goes back to the early 50s. Like I said, this Columbia Records, they had the Columbia Record Club. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're sending their artist out. You can buy them. And also, if you don't have a record player, well, you can get one by mail order through Columbia as well. See, people are talking so much smack about subscriptions like it's a brand new thing. This has been going on for almost 100 years now. Well, yeah, absolutely. The company starts growing rapidly and moves to Terre Haute, Indiana in 1956. We've driven through Terre Haute multiple times. <laughs> We've stayed we in Terre Haute. Stopped, we stop in Terre Haute simply because of the White Castle. <laughs> well, and the thing is, it is centrally located in oh, the yes United it is. States. Yes, so it is. So in order to be able to ship out around the country, uh -huh. that was a good place for Columbia House to set up shop. At that one point, sense. my research showed that one in eight people in town worked for Columbia House. Wow. Think about the economic impact that that has on a town. Well, yeah, and uh, the economic impact when it's no longer there. Absolutely. Even worse. Yeah, and if you're an employee, like if you're working there in the 90s, all the CDs that are being returned back, you could buy stock back from the company for pennies. Literally, the penny that someone else was sending, mm -hmm. you could buy a couple CDs from that from the company store. Also, I read a story about a kid who knew his dad was the local trash collector. Uh-huh. And he would have to make extra runs to the Columbia House 
warehouse when they would have overruns of CDs and albums. He said they had a massive music collection at home because they oh were gosh. allowed to pick through whatever they wanted oh, before they ever took them. And there's massive landfills that are filled. Like they have the history of different video games like Atari where they say they they destroyed all these games. Same things with albums and cassettes. Sometimes they had overruns that they had to destroy. They had to get rid of. So there are just landfills filled with that stuff so around Indiana. the best record stores are in Terre Haute. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> the Terre Haute uh, landfills may indeed <laughs> be... The best record stores in the country. Might be. So in 1958, it's really when it started kicking in even bigger. Instead of just being the Columbia Record Club, okay. Columbia Records starts being a clearing house for smaller labels. They were letting other labels use their distribution system, and they start sending out more labels than just what's on Columbia. Yeah. Okay, so they're under that umbrella. Membership reached over 3 million by 1975. The population in the United States in 1975 uh-huh. was 215 million. So higher math tells wow. me that'd be one in seven people wow. in America at one point or another at any given time were members of Columbia House Record Club at that time. I need to be studying their marketing. Right. Now, what I asked you earlier, think about where you saw those ads all the time in every magazine. And yes. you know why? Oh my gosh, every magazine. Well, it's Time Warner, right? Mm-hmm. And Time's growth through the 80s culminated in 1989 for their agreement to acquire Warner Communications for $14 billion at that point, creating one of the largest multimedia enterprises on earth. So they owned all the magazines. Exactly. And the biggest ones. Holy shit. Time, People, Sports Illustrated, Martha Stewart Living. Tapping into their synergies in 1990, they decided to launch Entertainment Weekly using Warner's tape and book subscription list. The people that are part of the Book of the Month Club and people that were part of the Tape and Record Club started getting Entertainment Weekly. So they were the they're the reason that every um, subscription service like there or, or when you sign up for something, we're like, I promise not to sell your information. Well, and that's exactly it, because even if you didn't sign up through their service, mm-hmm. if someone had signed a credit card receipt and left their information with a major hotel chain, they bought that information. No And they also way. sent it out to people, anything on a credit card form or major hotel registry. Yes. Wow. So you get those oh quarterly, God. remember when the magazine would come? Every once a quarter, it wouldn't just be in the magazine. All of a sudden, you would be getting a catalog from them yeah. in the mail. And those were the big ones. We had the stuff that wasn't on the pages. And people are giving so much shit to Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They own all the magazines, like you said. So think about how much money they're saving in advertising. Yeah. They're advertising their own product. Columbia House and BMG bought in, brought in tons and tons of money. By 2000, we're talking $1.5 billion wow. a year. Two years later, Columbia House then owners... Sony and AOL sold a majority stake of the company to the Blackstone Group. And this is important because Blackstone then flips Columbia House to a German media giant, Bertelsmann. Bertelsmann owned BMG. So we end up having Columbia House and BMG in the same company now. Wow. Right? Now they're affiliated with a company. They are still around. A company called Direct Brands, a direct marketer who also has the Book of the Month Club, Mm -hmm. so another subscription base. Columbia House and BMG had some clever ways of saving money, though. Until 2006, record record companies never actually secured written license to distribute those records. Columbia House sent them out to club members because they were pressing their own copies. They had started back in the 50s cutting a check for 75% royalties to the labels, sending them the checks. I never got away with that. Right? (laughs) So the labels continued to cash the checks, and Columbia House Mm -hmm. said, as long as you're cashing our checks, you must be okay with the agreement. Yep. Then what ended up happening, the publishers might not like the agreement. Didn't matter, because before the internet, one of the biggest ways to sell people direct to consumer were these clubs. Yeah. So if they complained too much, the Columbia House or BMG would just say, fine, we're not going to carry your labels or any of your artists. And that's two different distributors and basically everyone. They had a a complete monopoly. Absolutely. Exactly. Now, there's other theories on how they were able to save money. Some people thought that there was a lower quality audio. And you saw when I was doing this research how many tabs I had open Mm -hmm. to try and really narrow this down. 
And from anything I saw, there was never a discernible difference noticed. Some people notice it. I think I have in some of my records, some of the, I've gone to a record shop, right? And we bought some of the yeah. reprinted stuff and they sound yeah. a little bit thinner. They don't have as much bass in them. I never noticed any of that. Yeah. And, that, and what it says, it could be the, the, the construction of them. It might not yeah. just be the, the recording of it, but the construction of it as they made it. Another thing, there was a lack of royalty payments. Those CDs generally cost Columbia House only $1.50 to make each because they're printing them in-house. They're not taking inventory from the labels. And what they charge, like eleven ninety nine, wasn't exactly. that it? Exactly, yeah. The reason they kept it so low, like I said, they're not buying the records from the labels. They're, they're getting the master tapes and then pressing them in-house. Mm -hmm. And the records that you got for free... They didn't pay any royalties on those records. Because so it was only the charge. one that you bought that they paid the royalties on because the rest was just a gift. They were considered promotional. So any of your albums you got, if you got Nirvana's Nevermind wow. for free through Columbia House, Kurt Cobain netted zero dollars from that. Those introductory offers, though, there were two guys that took them to task on the offers. One of them, Joseph Parvin of Lawrenceville, New Jersey, the patron saint of anyone who ever wanted to get back <laughs> at Columbia House. This guy ended up in March 2000, 60 years old, admitted he had used 16 different post office boxes and his own home address to fleece Columbia House and BMG collectively out of 26,000 554 CDs. So was this dude reselling or was he just was he just bitter for some reason about something? I don't know about his case, but the reselling five months earlier, David Russo pled guilty to stockpiling 22,000 CDs. And yes, he was going around and reselling those at flea markets. Wow. And I can remember definitely in the 90s, wheeling and dealing in the secondhand stores mm -hmm. for CDs. Mm -hmm. Going into uh, and uh, taking ones that I no longer want in my collection, going selling them for two or three dollars and, and trading all the time. So that was definitely a huge thing in the 90s uh high profits they had after the freebies ran out too because we talked about printing it for a dollar 50 and then turning around and that one that you bought at full price yeah 11 12 and then we get into cds at the time i think it was 15 20 a piece so you think about the profit that they're making on the back end hand over fist at the time they kept most of the profits the company made as much as like you said almost like 11 12 bucks on yeah. each one of them and the aggressive collection ta tactics if you were a kid and you were like me, you didn't pay your bill, and then they kept coming after you. And that was mm -hmm. Trident Asset Management. That name might sound familiar to a lot of people. Oh, yeah. If you go to Consumer Affairs and Rip Off Report, they have pages and pages and pages sure. about them. They did very unfair collecting tactics. And the fact is, if you talk to any of the employees from Columbia House, they'll tell you that they had no teeth. Well, how could they? I mean, there's such a huge subscriber base that was under the age of 18. That so you huge. can't legally yes. like enter into a contract. And that's exactly how a lot of people got out of it. They said they were a minor. They never bothered checking. And in fact, they wouldn't check on any excuses. You could tell them you were claiming bankruptcy. You could mm -hmm. tell them you were moving out of the country. You could tell them you're going to jail and you're out of the bill. Wow. So in case you're wondering, like I said, yes, Columbia House is still around. Not in the way you remember, though. Uh, they have no ties to record or music anymore. They're simply there selling DVDs. The one thing that still remains like a cockroach in this world of digital, <laughs> DVDs somehow are still there. And the weird thing is, if you go to their website, yeah. it's not like walking into a brand new Blockbuster in 2024. Uh -huh. It's like walking into that weird old video store in your hometown so really? that's locally owned, has a strange selection, and Kinda the only thing they're funny. really messing is the curtain in the back. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing about Columbia House, if you go to Glassdoor.com, and you uh -huh. know Glassdoor.com, right? Yeah, that's the website where people can go on and talk about their employers. So right. you can research whether you want to work there, or salaries, or things like that. Employees anonymously reviewing companies. Based on the company's reviews, Columbia House and its parent company both dying a very slow, prolonged death. That's and weird. that's probably the way it should be. That's it for today. Until we open another Gen X Files. Go ahead and like and subscribe this video on YouTube and head over to genx.fm to sign up for our free weekly playlist. We'll talk to you later. Go Chiefs! <laughs>